Clubhouse. Welcome to this inaugural edition of Battle Beyond the Movies, the podcast where we compare movies with similar themes to see which movie did it best. This is Paul from Pod Clubhouse, and I have the honor of being joined by one of our most stalwart contributors and my partner on our coverage of the recent remake of The Stand, Sheila. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Let's get ready to rumble. Exactly right. That's the right <laughs> attitude to go into this sort of thing with. I was saving that one up, I tell you. I'll have to try to see if if I can find that sound effect to attach to this podcast. Yeah, well, when you initially sent this out as as a you know, as a test bubble of an idea, that's what kind of popped into my head with this like battle of beyond the movies. I was like, I definitely see like a rumble kind of thing happen because we really want to find like who's going to come out on top, right? Exactly. That is the point of the discussion. We compare movies with similar themes, but in this case, we're going to go a step further and actually take a look at an actual remake. So let's take a look at The Combatants. Meet The Combatants. In honor of the creepy connection Sheila has to the source material, our first battle is between the Amityville Horror and its 2005 remake of the same name. While we won't do remakes every episode, I just thought this was a great place to start given like your connection, the spooky time of year, kind of where we just passed the uh, anniversary of the DeFeo murders in the first place. So, you know, it, it was a confluence of contributing factors. Right. You were just steered in one direction maybe by an otherworldly hand who knows we'll have to see (laughs) it's up for debate much like the (laughs) events that happened at 112 ocean avenue the first combatant is the amityville horror that came out in 1979 directed by stuart rosenberg this one most closely covers the novel that had been written previously by jay anson and uh, if you look on imdb george lutz the, mm, uh, who, what would you say? Like the man of the house, I guess, for the story itself is also credited as a writer. I think he had a great influence over the novel. And since the novel really informs the script itself, he gets credit like a, like a story credit. Also, have you seen this movie recently other than us watching it the other day? I've only seen it once, the original. Um, I hadn't seen the remake until you and I watched it together the other day, as as fate would have it. I was definitely in high school when I saw it, and my friends and I, we kind of went like on an old movie binge. So I'd seen Taxi Driver, which we covered many months back, and Amityville Horror, that was part of it, because, you know, we were Queens kids, so it's not all that far removed, and we really didn't know anything about it. So I hadn't seen it in oh, 25, 27 years. I thought I had seen it. But the events that I remember were not depicted in this movie. So it's, it's, it's a pretty <laughs> what, good chance. What did you see then? Well, it turns out that the Amityville Horror has fueled many indirect sequels that use the Amityville uh, name in the title. I would say they probably spawned. Spawned. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good word. And so I probably saw one of those thinking that it was the real deal. In case you are like me and confused about which of the, I don't know, like 30 movies or something uh, with Amityville in the title, this is the one starring James Brolin. I'm coming apart! Oh, mother of God, I'm coming apart! And Margot Kidder. Hello. As George and Kathy Lutz. Like I said, it came out in 1979. So if you're trying to place this in kind of movie history, this would be right after Margot Kidder had been in Superman 1. Gosh, on the whole, I'd say it's been swell. Swell? Yeah. You know, Clark, um, there are very few people left in the world who feel comfortable saying that word. What word? Swell, really? Oh, so it was kind of natural. And so she was pretty famous at that stage of her career. Way back when, Margot Kidder was really the only face that I really recognized beyond the um, the dude from Top Gun. Who, he's the captain of. He's the, like the captain, the the commander. I guess it would be commander. Um, and he's the one who's you know 
telling Tom Cruise, Son, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. He plays like the lead detective and he's the one that gives the time of death. So other than him, it was really Margot Kidder because I'm a big Superman fan. But I recognized James Brolin back in the 90s only because Josh Brolin's his son and, you know, Goonies was a big part of my childhood. So, ah. which is throwing an enormous ton of shade on James Brolin's long career. He had a lot going on in the 70s. I'm just going to ask for forgiveness for my 14, 15 year old stupid self. <laughs> That's OK. I mean, he, he although he has been on TV in recent years, Brolin is on that TV show with Colin Hanks, that life in pieces. He's not like a huge part, but he is one of the characters because that's one of those shows that has about like 12 main characters. So no one gets that much airtime any given week. But yeah, he is steadily worked. He's very famously married to Barbara Streisand. One fun fact I found was that he was so popular in the mid-70s that he was this close to being cast as James Bond. Stop it. I, I, I know they were like screen testing him, but Roger Moore decided to come back and star in Octopussy. Oh, okay. Well, but you know what? I could definitely see that. Like he's got that like distinguished silver foxy kind of look to him. Although we saw him at the height of just that 70s glam hair. Exactly. In this movie. And if you compare him to George Lutz of that period, I think he's a lot bigger than George, but he had the, like the shaggy hair and the full Manson-esque beard. <laughs> and, and yeah, it was that. just like part and parcel of the time, I think, too. It was not an attractive time, no. No, between the big lapels on the, the collars and lots of leather, lots of avocado. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was a popular appliance color, believe it or not. We had, we had avocado green in my house in the 80s. So Margot stars as Kathy. And if you look back at pictures of Kathy back then, she was blonde. But if you look at later pictures... She did have brown hair, but not as dark as Margot Kidder's hair. There was sort of like a weird thing they did. I don't know if this was just trying to capture maybe the difference in age between the two, but did you notice that they had Margot dressed very young? Like how she yes. had pigtails yeah. and sort of a schoolgirl like uh skirt. plaid skirt. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, that's what I thought of. And then when you said the pigtails, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember the pigtails. The casting for the remake that we're gonna talk about with Melissa George is probably a little closer visually. Right. Uh, but I, I think they were just trying to hit on on having the most famous woman they could find. <laughs> yeah, just great, grabbing that name recognition. Fresh role. off, you know, Superman, you're definitely going to be somebody people like, oh yeah, it's Lois Lane. Exactly. Let me go see it. Within the creative end of this, like I said, there was a lot of influence from George what do you want from us? Lutz. And we'll probably discuss some of that. Like, for instance, the guy that wrote it, Stern, he was mostly a TV writer, except for maybe multiple episodes on The Mod Squad. Really didn't do much that, that a lot of people would remember him for. God, The Mod Squad. Like, like we're <laughs> dialing it back. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. and, and, and Rosenberg, the director, his most famous work was Cool Hand. What? we've got here is failure to communicate luke which is a pretty famous movie it's with pretty Paul rad Lee. yeah it's pretty rad but other than that nothing else really bubbles to the top of what today's audiences might have heard of up against the 1979 version we're also looking at 2005's remake so what's the catch there was a crime, a, a murder. In the house? Directed by Andrew Douglas, written by Scott Kosar, and starring the immortal Ryan Reynolds. To a perfect house, and to a perfect family. And the more mortal Melissa George <laughs> as the Lutzes. This one also featured a very young Chloe Grace Moretz in one of her first roles. Who are you talking to? The girl who lives in my closet. And what's her name? Jody. I think this was an introducing her, wasn't this? Was that this her very it first that, movie cred? Yeah, you're correct. It did say that. IMDb does list a couple of TV credits before this, so they may have been like really background roles or, or something. So maybe this was like her first feature Mm -hmm. If you don't know who she is, you probably know who she is. She's <laughs> she's very recognizable, even as yes. uh, what eight year old. She's always kind of looked about the same, just kind of grown up now. But if you don't know who she is, she was uh, in Kick Ass. 
She was a vampire in Let Me In. She was in another remake as Carrie in Carrie. Oh, yeah. Very cool. And recently she was in the Tom and Jerry live action animation blend. Which is where I have very high facial recognition of her from. See? I have a small child in the house. I mean, it wasn't bad, right? I mean, oh, no, I liked it. I thought it was very cute. What do you want from a Tom and Jerry movie? Citizen oh, it was King? very slapsticky, and she was great. She did a very believable job interacting with animated creatures who were not actively in front of her. Yeah, so, and I thought she did great. The creatives behind this one, Andrew Douglas, this was his. Would you be surprised, Sheila, to learn that this was his first feature film? Surely you just. It's my first day. <laughs> <laughs> He does not really do features anymore. He mostly went on to do more um, music videos and documentaries. And then also a couple episodes of Mind Hunters. Did you ever catch that on uh, I did very much so. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Mostly what Andrew Douglas has done has been those music videos. I like music videos. I like documentaries. I really liked Mindhunter. In fact, John just finished it, I wouldn't say, probably right around Halloween. He finally like got around to it. I was like, where's this been all my life? So yeah, so we're we're fans of, of uh, Mr. Douglas's work. The writer, Scott Kosar, he's, he's a little more proven out. He's written a few other remakes. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake that I think came from this same platinum dunes group there was sort of a period in the 2000s where michael bay was producing these remakes of existing horror movies if you look you'll find like chainsaw you'll find this you'll find nightmare on elm street you'll find friday the 13th all come from this same group of of filmmakers and and if you if you did watch them back to back you'd find they have a very similar aesthetic even though michael bay isn't in the director's chair i think he picked people that would kind of channel him (laughs) if you will yeah Uh, i see that i see that definitely and through like the vein of some of those i didn't see all of them because i'm not really a not really a deep into the horror genre but i will dip my toe in for certain things like i didn't really i don't know if this is too early to say but like i didn't really find these to be horror movies i found them to be more like horror light especially the 1979 but interestingly kozar also wrote and produced uh, several episodes of the Bates Motel. I don't know if you ever caught that on TV, but that's a pretty good. I liked that. Yeah. Reinterpretation of the psycho movie and characters. And he also wrote the machinist with uh, a movie with Christian Bale, where he lost like a ton. Oh, of he weight. lost like 90 pounds or something like that. And then a he put dangerous on a dangerous amount of weight. <laughs> he got down to like 119 pounds or something like that. Like it was disgusting. It was like, ugh. you don't was... recognize him. I mean, if you're a true fan, like you recognize him, but, um, and then he went right from the machinist to the role of Batman and Batman begins. And he had to put on something like a hundred pounds in like eight months. And that wasn't just weight that he put on. That was like, I mean, if you saw Batman begins, which is actually one of the ones that we have in this yeah. be- beyond the battle movies. He's ripped. Yeah. He's Jack. But yeah, no, that was a very disturbing movie. So like that I like, I like those kind of like psychological, like messing with your head movies. To kind of fit the mold of what Bay's remakes wanted to show audiences, they always found sexy people doing incredible things. And who fits the bill any more than Ryan Reynolds, especially in that period? He's only three years removed from Van Wilder, and he's sort of in a patch of more forgettable movies for him, but still popular, very popular. Also, Melissa George, she she may not be a household name, but she was recently in Apple TV Plus's production of The Mosquito Coast, starring opposite Justin Theroux in that series that they just made. And she was also a regular on Alias and Grey's Anatomy uh, for various periods. So she's also a very steady working actress through the last, you know, 15, 20 years. She's originally Australian, so I had seen her when I was there in school in the late 90s on reruns of Neighbors, like this soap opera show that they have. <laughs> oh, yeah? If you're an Australian or New Zealand actor, like you basically kind of like break your chops on Neighbors. Like, uh, what is it, EastEnders in... Uh, yeah, in, similar uh, on to On the BBC. Yeah. It's a soap opera, so they, I mean, there's daily episodes, so in a year... You could have hundreds and hundreds of episodes done. But I definitely knew her from Alias. Like, that's where I had, like, the facial recognition from her. I mean, she's one of the actresses that when you see her, you know that you've seen her in other stuff. 
Right. Sadly, though, whenever I think of her, I think of Regina George. <gasps> Vintage. So adorable. Thanks. <laughs> that is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. Who she has no relation to. <laughs> 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 and I shouldn't because I don't, why would I think that she's a mean girl? Why would I think that? <laughs> well, it's just where your your brain wants to go there. I get it. Both movies were financially successful because they were shot on super low budgets and profited from different things. The first one probably profited from, like you noticed, the timing was very close to The Exorcist in kind of people's minds and right. what they were interested in at the time. And not all that far removed from the actual crime. That was right. committed. That's right. The first one went on to make $86 million, and I think they shot it for less than a million dollars. Oh, well, good for them. That made it one of the most successful indie movies until like 1990. I don't know. I don't know who discovered this, but the factoid I found said that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie surpassed it. Heroes in a half shell, turtle power. I saw that same thing too. I was like, wow. I was like, whoever finds these things, thank you. Because, and you make us sound so smart. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the second movie went on to make $108 million, which, yes, is more <laughs> than, than the first movie. But if you think about it, is Inflation it really? and, you know, what right. was a dollar worth in 1979 versus a dollar in 2005? Exactly. I'd say they're probably equal if we uh, remove inflation. But they did make money because they only spent, I think, like they said, $19 million on it, something like that. So the scale of it is still fine from a financial standpoint for the from filmmakers. From a profit and loss market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you suppose the critics thought of these two movies? Well, I'm just going to go by what our initial impressions afterwards were like, eh, it could have been better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> Uh, I, thought, I thought we were just being harsh. <laughs> no, the critics did not like these movies. Oh, Although okay. there there has been some circumspect rose-colored glasses for the first one. Because it does bear some of the hallmarks of that creepy 70s era horror that came out. Like the, you know, Texas Chainsaw or whatever that has sort of this grisly, what would you say, almost documentary sort of feel. That feels more real than kind of the flashy whiz-bang effects that you get with more modern. And it just had this creep factor too. the first one with the, the injection of the Catholic church element. That's what I was making the comparison to the exorcist. I don't know if they were trying to like draw on that theme to further that conversation, or at least maybe draw in those fans. Well, let's head in to the section called the battleground. point of this show is to examine the themes that two movies have in common. And the theme that I got for this one is definitely just the haunted house. It was really about the house and what the house was imparting on its residents and what they were feeling. And it was prevalent in both movies as the main theme. So if you are listening to this podcast and thank you for doing so. Yes, thank you. And you don't know what in the hell we're talking about. Let's back up and say what happened at this house in the first place. Because both movies start out based on the true story. Exactly. Not a true story. And I was wondering if that was significant, but we will talk about the true story. So this house that I mentioned, 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, is it Long Island or New York? How do you how do you guys list your... Uh, uh, it would be Amityville, New York. And then if you want to be like, well, New York's a big place. Where is that? Uh, it would be in Suffolk County, Long Island. All right, so this house, unfortunately, had a mass murder take place in 1974, November 13th, 1974. Ronnie DeFeo was convicted of murdering his six family members, his parents and his siblings, by gunshot. High-powered rifle. Right, in their beds. There are a lot of question marks about how this went down exactly. I saw things that suggested that it might have been possible that a twist on the story was that his sister Dawn had actually killed everybody and then he killed Dawn. Had you ever heard anything like that? Well, he had changed his story so many times in the immediate aftermath that he was trying to pin it on a mafia hitman. Mm -hmm. Not a good plan. <laughs> he was also very 
uh, I'm not going to, I don't know if he's addicted is the right word, but he was very much into the drug culture. So he was taking some pretty heavy things. He was doing heroin. He was doing LSD. So like, you know, there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of question marks. And he kept changing his story even after he went to prison. He was still blaming different people and blaming his sister and that he had, he was so distraught he had to kill her. But I believe the forensics proved out most of those theories. So this is the part where you, you can tell uh, I, 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 I teased. You did. You did. I was waiting for like the little moment for me to jump in. So I am one degree removed from this grisly murder scene. (laughs) I live on Long Island. I live in Levittown, which is uh, about 15 or 20 minutes from Amityville. Uh, A friend of mine who was born and raised in Amityville was actually at Henry's Bar where Roddy DeFeo went after a period of time, he he basically tried to set up his day where he was with his girlfriend for part of the day. So it's believed that the murder happened in the middle of the night and then he kind of went about his day. He was with his girlfriend, tried to call his family at home. Nobody was picking up. Neighbors that he called said, yeah, the cars are there. We don't know what's going on. So he made a show of going to this bar and he went home. He called from the bar, said he was going to go check and see what happened. And he came back to the bar shortly after. So around 630 in the evening is when things really started to heat up. He came back and he was kind of like out of his character. And he was really like saying things that people weren't really understanding. He said that they're all shot. Like somebody shot my whole family. My friend was at the bar when all of this went down. So he was there. It's basically, it's like the local watering hole. They used to go there after work. A lot of them were blue collar workers in the different trades. There was carpenters, there was stonemasons. And, you know, so they, they knock off kind of early and yeah, so that's where all of the, the calls started coming into, cause no cell phones. Um, they were, <laughs> you know, they were calling the cops to go to the house and, and he, you know, saying that they were all shot. And then this story came out then afterwards that this mafia hitman was somehow involved. Yeah. So my friend who was there, friends with Ronnie DeFeo, everyone called him Butch. The story just kind of like morphed over the next couple of days and then it became this hitman. And then he was taken, he was taken to protective custody. Then he was later arrested because they were like, this, this isn't right. right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this, <laughs> things aren't adding up here. And then he confessed and he was arrested. So it, it was a bit of a mess. So I was actually taken by the house uh, a good few years ago. We were on their boat and uh, we went around to the little channel over there, the Amity River it's called. It's right on the Atlantic Ocean. You can see it. it looks nothing like what the house in the movies looked like because the owners over the years have definitely changed it to make it look different. And the town of Amityville wants nothing to do with it. So they actually invested in changing the address. That's right. I had read that there is no 112 Ocean Avenue anymore. It does not come up in ways. <laughs> <laughs> in preparation for this podcast, I had seen a documentary about not the movies, but about the DeFeo murders and then the kind of the ensuing business with uh, the Lutz family post them moving out and, and all that kind of stuff. They did talk to either the owner of the bar or the bartender, and he was a man of few words, and he... <laughs> made it clear that he thought Ronnie just went home and shot his family. There was no, no ambiguity in his mind that there was anything more elaborate to it than that, that his family was hard on him, I guess, by reputation, that his father was tough on him, like harder than I guess the usual, if that's a thing. And he just, he just snapped one day. That's what his belief was. That's the setup for this house where one of Ronnie's excuses at one point was that he heard a voice in his mind telling him to do this crazy stuff. And that started to create this idea that there's something in the house. So a year later, the Lutz family buys the house at a bargain rate. And at the price, it is a bargain And they say that they experience something and move out 28 days later. And that is the basis of the story for both movies. Spooky. (laughs) Right. 28 days, not even a month. Yeah. Although in the first movie, I think they only lasted like 19 days. Uh, Maybe, you know, the budget insisted. (laughs) (laughs) They rearranged the timeline. Yeah. (laughs) And the second movie does go for 28 days, but it's less connected to the original work. There are several beats that are the same script wise, but then there are several other things that it strays with. So in terms of this theme, the haunted house theme, 
do you still think that this is a theme that is worth telling, worth revisiting, worth having these kinds of movies and stories come out? Or do you think it's played out? I don't know. I kind of like the notion of a haunted house. If you go to most amusement parks, there's some element of a haunted house, a haunted mansion, depending on what park you're in. I like the idea of a house having a story and a history and things that can like go bump in the night. I don't know. I, I like the nature of this controlled scare. Controlled in the sense that I'm the audience member and I can pause that shit whenever I need to. <laughs> Turn on some more lights. I tend to have an overactive imagination when it comes to watching these types of movies, which is why I stick to the horror light genre. But I like this notion of a haunted house. I am i don't think it's overplayed necessarily if the theatrics are right or if the storyline, you know, tries to take it in a different direction. If the, somebody that just comes, you know, behind a closed door, yeah, it's not that scary. But the elements that were here, I thought were inventive and were interesting, especially the differences between the two movies. I'm thinking more like along the, like the crucifix use. Mm. I like this notion of a haunted house. I'm, I'm in for it. And there's always this element of where your imagination goes after the movie's over. So you hear a creak in your own house on the stairs that always creaks in that one spot. But mm, how much do I really know about the history of my own house? <laughs> well, Carolyn and I have lived in a house that had been abandoned at one point. So we definitely had those moments where we didn't want to go and find out what was making that noise. Or <laughs> yeah. You know what? The sun will be up in about six, eight hours. We'll right. just find out then. We got over it. But yeah, it was creepy there for a little while. Yeah, I think there's still a lot of mileage to get out of haunted houses. Personally, I have a weird interest in like abandoned places. Not so much that I want to go in and check them out myself, but I am game to watch like videos and stuff of other braver souls than I making their way through abandoned insane asylums and shit like that. <laughs> I'm all for that stuff. I actually went to an abandoned insane asylum in Tasmania in Australia. And I will tell you, I have never been as scared as I was in that stone building. Wow. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm down for like this, you know, like a controlled scare like that. I was at a control scare. <laughs> I will be <laughs> honest, but like watching it with you at nine 30 on a Thursday morning was, yeah, it was pretty tame. Yeah. With sun coming in. <laughs> oh, it was warm. Yeah. It was snacks. It was friendly good dogs company. around. Yeah. yeah. There was lots of homey things to counteract the spooky. <laughs> there have been a few good haunted house I would say shows that have come out. I, I particularly like The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor that have recently been on Netflix, where those stories were allowed to simmer over much more time since they were series and they could bring a, a new take to the idea of a haunted house. So yes, there are ghosts, but they have their reasons, you know? Right. They have their purposes. I really liked those too. So, and then also just telling it in that way makes you just, I think, more invested in the haunting. So even though it is an older theme, as long as people have been living places, there have probably been tales of bad things happening and, and then other bad things happening later in those same places and people keeping that memory connected and assigning a creepiness factor, you know, to those places as a, as a result. These two movies are an attempt to take that idea and turn it into like a media circus because that is basically what happened in reality that's how these movies even came to be yeah that's a fair assessment basically saying like we're gonna take this and we're gonna jazz it up because apparently the original story wasn't gruesome enough i suppose i'm not sure how to like categorize it but yeah it was basically taking some facts and taking the artistic liberties because even like the lore around here like I grew up in Queens, you know, so it's not all that far removed. You know, and that's where I was watching the video of it back in like the mid 90s. My husband, who grew up here in Levittown his entire life, didn't know that much about it. Really? He thought, yeah, he thought it was just more along the lines. It was a haunted house. People were killed there. But he was like, I didn't know that the guy killed his whole family. Not until our friend told us, you know, that he was like sitting in the bar. So, yeah, the town of Amityville has done a really good job squashing the murder aspect. And they're fine to let the horror part, the haunted house part just die down in and of itself. But, yeah, like the lore of it has really taken on the life of the movies. Because, like, there's really nobody here to kind of refute it because the, the whole town is basically like, we just want it to go away. <laughs> 
don't hurt our property values because when they were laughing, I was laughing when they said like uh, in the first movie that it was like eighty thousand dollars. It could might as well be eight hundred thousand dollars. Like try a couple of million on the water here, you know. Keep those thoughts in mind as we move on to yeah. the next segment of the podcast. Getting my boxing gloves on, tying them tight. Personally, I thought that although the first movie, the 1979 edition, was pretty short on flashy scares, did not a lot of jump scares. There were a couple, but you know, they didn't have modern visual effects. They had that 70s era blood for makeup effects that clearly mm-hmm. doesn't resemble blood other than it's reddish. Yeah, it's like almost like a reddish version of, uh, or a thicker version of motor oil, tinted red. <laughs> right. I thought that that one created this idea of the haunted house quite a bit better than than the the second one. The second one was creepy. Well, houses don't kill people. (laughs) But I thought that it showed a lot more than it needed to and thus put it all on the surface, whereas the second one actually kept some things away from us and allowed our our imaginations to make it worse. The first movie, the one that came out in 79, was definitely about how the house had this personality. It's the kind of house they don't build anymore. In and of itself. Whereas the second movie was more like the people got affected more, it seemed to me, than like the house kind of doing it to them. Yeah. George, in the first movie, when he left the house, he was okay again. Whereas in the second movie, it was more like the house had taken over people, almost like the, like a, a possession. In the second movie, they wanted to assign the haunting itself to a person named John Ketchum. It's okay, Mommy. Jody won't hurt you. But the man who lives here, she says he's bad. If you recall, the mm-hmm. uh, magnet letters on the fridge changed to catch him and kill him. Uh, yeah. That's supposed to connect us to the discovery of this person named John Ketchum who had been torturing Native Americans on that plot of land sometime in that place's history. And so, although we don't ever see exactly that form perform any of the haunting or the ghost form of that person, we do get kind of glimpses of them doing this torture business. It's meant to be clear in our minds that this is the ghost that's pissed off about everything, and he's still here doing this to us, the Lutzes. In the first movie, though, it could be a lot of things. It could be some random spirit. It could be some other Native American stuff that had happened on that land before. Was the John Ketchum idea also in that first one? I can't I can't recall right off the top of my head. It was. Do you remember when the friend Carolyn? Carolyn and the, and the co-worker? The co-worker, yeah. So when she comes in, she sort of has this like trance-like state yes. where she gives us a bit of the history of this house. She she seemed to have like been, you know, read up on it. Now you're beginning to give me the creeps. There was a tribe of Indians called the Shinnecocks, and they used this land as a sort of exposure pen. They put all the crazy people here. And they left him here to die. Oh my God. Yeah, she seems to channel something in that moment. Yeah, she she definitely takes an otherworldly look in her eyes, like she's far away. And she talks about this John Ketchum character, and he originated in Salem, Massachusetts. He was part of the witch trials. He built a house here at Amityville and engaged in devil worship. And that's when she talks about energy changing form. So like the bad energy that he had in that house, almost like the house took in that energy. George, there's one simple rule. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. Alan, when you get a grip on yourself, you sound like some kind of psycho weirdo. Aha. Okay, so there we go. I think that's probably one of the primary differences in the effectiveness of which movie is the better haunted house story because the house absorbs the energy, whereas in the second one, the house just happens to be where this pissed off ghost lives. Right. It's just looking for the next person to carry on the malevolent shenanigans, I suppose. Another element that I think helped with the haunting factor uh, of the first one is 
how much more they invested in the priest character. Right. That was definitely something that I did not see at all, almost at all in the second movie. The Catholic element for me really set up this very spooky, otherworldly, you know, this this dance between good and evil, heaven and hell. Dogs and cats living together. Uh, mass hysteria, man, <laughs> right. you know, but I definitely got that feeling so much more from the first book um, when Father Delaney's in, the, in the, the church and he's doing the blessing and the... He's feeling the statue kind of crumbling and, and doing all kinds of really unstatue like things, and he goes blind. Bridget. What is it, Father? I can't see. Oh, I'm blind. Mm-hmm. You know, there was definitely this, the house's energy is transferring into these people and it's not just when they're in the house. So there was definitely more of this push and pull of good and evil, heaven and hell. Where is this going? How are these people going to end up well at the end of this if uh, they don't stand a chance if priests are getting taken out here? Fun fact about the priest, uh, his real name was Pecorero or Pecoraro. I'm not up on my regional names like that you could go either and i think you'd be okay we have pecoraros pecoraro and his name was changed for the novel which was written by jay anson to uh, mancuso for the first movie he was father delaney and for the second movie he was father calloway that was meant to protect father pecoraro's identity in reality, he was a trained priest, but also, uh, if you remember, he says that he was a trained psychoanalyst. I am not some pink cheek seminarian who doesn't know the difference between the supernatural and a bad clam. I am a trained psychotherapist. I went into that house, and what I saw there was real. What I felt there was real, and what I heard there was real. Now, gentlemen, I have a family in my parish that's at great risk, and they are facing real danger. Yeah, I do remember that. I was like, hmm. And apparently he was also a lawyer. So when the other priests... Gee, a real, like, underachiever. (laughs) Right. So when the other priests kind of get up in his face about his uh, secular education or whatever, I guess that's an artifact of his real-life history, um, was that he was a very highly qualified guy. But in the, in the first movie, it shows him coming and trying to bless the house and that kind of going off little, the rails. A little sideways on him, right? Yeah. Stuff that you see in that first movie in particular is stuff reported by the Lutz family and takes place in the novel. So like the one room where the blessing goes awry with the flies and the window that can shut by itself and all that stuff, that was all reported. Also the pipes and sinks and toilets filling up with blackish green goo and that stuff, that's all stuff that they say that they saw while they were living in the house. That stuff, it took place in the second movie, but it seemed to be this like recurring thing like, oh, the, the toilet's doing that again kind of thing in the first movie when the, in the second movie it was just more like they'd hit do sort of like an orchestra hit and be like, Meow, and, and, <laughs> and, and show the mass of flies converging on the, on the priest. But then I, I don't recall flies being much of a, a problem after that. In the second movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the flies were not as much of a main starring character as they were in the first movie. Right. Then there was just more of some subtle things, you know, like the decline of George, the need to stay warm, (laughs) the the wood chopping. Oh, my God, the wood chopping. Move it from there to there. Go. Go.
I was getting some severe shining moments. And I got to give Caroline credit because she walked through and she goes, dude, I'm getting some like real shining. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm feeling. So the shining hadn't yet come out as a movie because she said Jack Nicholson. She goes, I'm getting real Jack Nicholson vibes from him. Mm-hmm. And it was it was in the first movie. But I want to say, like, I feel in the second movie that they were really leaning into that Jack Nicholson shining break from reality with George's behavior. One of the things I kind of made a note of was, you know, he's got this like possessed stare, like he's walking with the axe and the axe is dragging behind him. I'm like, damn it. Like his possession extends to his walk. But I did feel that there was a lot of similarities in the second movie to the Jack Nicholson character from The Shining. I don't know. Did you did you get that? I think I can see that pretty easily that he might have found a lot of inspiration there and kind of the menace and the um, what would you call kind of supernatural stalker kind of mode that he went into when he was kind of chasing his family around the house. Yeah, yeah. It's very similar feel. I was getting a little Patrick Bateman as well from American <laughs> Psycho. I mean, like if he had a chainsaw, I've been like, damn, I've seen this movie before. No, but I think with the 2005 special effects, the aesthetic, George's eyes really creeped me out. There was a lot of like his pupils were really dilated mm, yeah. and it just gave him this really uh, like... I'm not going to want to meet you in a dark alley kind of a look because you're, you're going to give me nightmares. At the end of the movie, that was one signal that he had come back to himself. uh, Yes. His eyes went back to normal. Right. They retracted in their dilation. Whereas George in the 79 version, they they did a lot of more makeup to his eyes. Like his eyes were really dark underneath the, the dark circles where it was harder to tell that he'd come back to himself because he just had the sheen of like cold sweat He had the dark circles, whereas I just thought the eyes aesthetic in the second movie really kind of showed the possession or the overtake, whatever we want to call that, from the house's influence. Well, the Lutzes were, you know, highly criticized in real life following the movie, especially because a lot of people thought that the whole thing was a hoax and that it was all part of a gigantic plan. That included getting this novel written, that included having Ed and Lorraine Warren who would go on to become subjects of the Conjuring movies, come and do like spiritual ghost busting or something in in the house while they still owned it, as well as other demonologists and things like that to come and look. They, you know, the Warrens say that the, that the house is haunted. And if you believe the kinds of things that the Warrens say, then, then maybe it is. But a lot of people, found fault with the idea that there would be millions of dollars generated by this horror and then everybody else that ever lived in that house afterwards never had anything go wrong. I don't know. To this day, 46 years later, it's still inhabited. It's a a multi-million dollar oceanfront home. So there has to be something to the fact that people have been living there continuously for 40 years and no problems. (laughs) Right, right. The first movie has much more involvement with with George Lutz, at least I believe so, especially right there at the end. Like you just mentioned, there's a moment when George has like a turn. I I saw your picture in the newspaper. Okay, I wouldn't hurt you. From a guy that was digging graves like a half an hour ago, (laughs) you know, he realizes that he's about to uh, hurt one of the kids, and he's like, oh. Let's get out of here. What am I doing? Yeah, (laughs) Time to go. Right. And then he grabs up everybody, goes back for the dog, and then they leave. This is a point that actually George Lutz, in reality, sued the second movie about. Did you know that? I did not know that. That is shocking. Apparently, the dog killing is what got him. You know, I was like, why was that necessary? Didn't happen the first movie. Why'd you have to go there? Well, that's that twist. We got to add something. What are we going to do? Well, it's kind of a cheap, gruesome act to kill an animal. 
a family pet. By cheap, I mean it instantly grabs at people's heartstrings in a way that often killing actual characters doesn't. I feel bad saying that, but like we watch a lot of Yellowstone and like the horses get hurt. We're like, why do you have to hurt the horse? Take out the bad guy riding on the horse. (laughs) Right, exactly. I don't feel I don't feel anything for him because, you know, the horse is just innocent here. (laughs) He's just being told what to do. But yeah, no, I did not like it. That was one of my big criticisms of like the movie. The second movie was why did you have to kill the dog? Unfortunately, uh, Lutz's lawsuit was never resolved. He died before it it went to trial or or was settled. He died in 2006. Kathy had died a couple of years before that. And they had divorced sometime in the late 80s. You don't say. I don't know. I don't know if a house haunting is going to be like, is, is that in the for better, for worse? Neither one of the movies depicted a, a family that seemed like on, on very solid ground, uh, emo- yeah, you know, emotionally. You, you, built, you built coffins with my name on it? I mean, I'd be sick of that. <laughs> right. I feel like there is a limit to for better, for worse. You know, we, we lived through a pandemic and quarantine and lockdown. I'm like, I didn't hear this in the vows. I did not hear and through lockdown. In those vows. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote those a long time ago. They were right. they didn't even know about washing hands when they wrote that. Yeah. Like we were, we were told to hold hands <laughs> in that ceremony. Um, <laughs> but I'm not surprised that they divorced. Now, I just have a question just on a procedural point. And I know we don't have the lawyer in Pod Clubhouse here to answer these questions. Sure. But like my family has been part of a lawsuit very recently. And I've had to sign a disclosure saying that upon terms of settlement, I will not. So like my father is part of this lawsuit. So he's the plaintiff and I, as his child have to agree to not pursue the contents of the lawsuit any further than what's been agreed to. Mm -hmm. So like, even if my father passes away, I, as his child cannot continue any further than the terms of the settlement. Sure. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just curious as to like why that lawsuit kind of, I guess because they divorced and like the stepkids are his kids, I suppose. My research told me that, that, uh, I think it was Billy, Mm -hmm. the older son has tried to carve out his own section of the Amityville horror universe by writing his own book and account of shit that happened to him. That's my respectful term for, I'm sure the, the content of the, of the book shit that happened to him <laughs> that'll be the subtitle the right. cult. from from his point of view and stuff that's gone on in his life since then i think it's called it my amityville horror is is his contribution to the mythos but i don't know if he had any party to the or any part to the lawsuit see george was pissed because it was like defamation of his name it was george lutz on screen killing this dog you right know? that was personal so he, he he did see the movie he hated it that's a very big difference from the other movie. Apparently the cast and things were encouraged to tell people that spooky stuff was happening on the set and, and stuff like that. For uh, which movie? The first one? Yeah, 1979. Yeah. No, that's not cool. Especially it wasn't shot there. It was shot elsewhere. It was shot in New Jersey. It's, it, yeah. They recreated the house in Tom's River, which is yeah. nowhere near Amityville. It was, it was like a facade that they put. No, actually, no. Sorry. They they recreated the out, the exterior of the house. It was the second movie where they built on top of an existing house to create the Amityville facade. Mm-hmm. I thought the second house was too overdone. Like they kind of lost the thread of what made the house look like itself in the design of the second house. Yeah, the first house I felt was authentic 70s had been abandoned quickly where the second house just didn't have the same cohesiveness. It didn't, uh, maybe that's why it was like, it was built upon. There wasn't maybe the same continuity throughout. I think I read it was built in Chicago or the shot in Chicago. So like, you're not going to get the same architectural style or, or time period kind of trees, (laughs) you know, just trees hanging around. No, I thought the first house was a little creepier, did a better job and just in and of itself, the basement, the basement was definitely like creeping me out big time in the first one. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the second one seemed like they had gone out of their way to set decorate this idea that the DeFeos had left only the rustiest, creepiest shit possible <laughs> in, their, right. in their basement. But meanwhile, there was nobody left to kind of clean it up. Right. Whereas in the, in the first movie, yeah, there was a couple things down there. And it didn't seem to look be be a place where you would choose to hang out a lot. The idea of the red room, though, the way they executed it in the first movie with never really showing us what was in there and leaving it to be in our mind, like what was what was going on here with that at the area that they chiseled out. I thought in one way, that's what you get with 70s era effects and limitations of budget and all that. But another way it worked better than flashing the gory torture scenes in the second movie. The first movie didn't need to show me the cutaway scenes that we saw in movie two of the torture devices that were used, where in the first movie, we mentioned her before, this this secondary supporting character, a friend, a co-worker, Caroline, she comes in and she gives us this backstory, like I mentioned before, about John Ketchum and the witch trials. There was devil worship. Of course. It's right here. It's history. John Ketchum. So? Listen, they ran him out of Salem for being a witch. And he built his house exactly where you're living. You're living on some sort of special ground that devil worship, death, sacrifice. And how she was so transported in, in telling the story and then the cutaway, then seeing the, the red light coming out of this unearthed tomb, really, it allowed my imagination to do what my imagination does when I watch these types of movies. I am imagining the devil worship, somebody who's connected to witch trials, hunting down women and killing them, thinking that they're witches, could not have been a pleasant experience for the person who's being hunted. So I Unlikely, can only yeah. I can only just imagine like where that all went. So I didn't need to see these people being hung up on hooks and the graphic and the gorier things because my imagination was already hook, line, and sinker taking me there just from the, you know, seizure-inducing redness that was coming, the flashing red that was coming out of this this hole in the ground. I mean, we, we had like the image of George seeing a reflection of kind of himself when he first bashes open the wall. Yes. It could have been him, but they made it pretty clear that Ronnie, I, I did, did Brolin play the Ronnie flashback character like the imagery because uh, it, it looked like him and i think i made that point too it's like i was like i think that's him i think they have him playing ronnie because when uh kathy goes to the library when sees the microfiche it really looks like him it does like, kind of identical <laughs> yeah so unless they found some you know does james brolin have a brother that's not credited in the movie because i mean <laughs> it was that close in terms of that Seeing himself there, it pointed us toward this I, I, idea that there was a presence in the house, but it was playing with him, manipulating him, and kind of focused on him, which in the uh, second movie, they made it kind of dispersed in terms of where this focus was. Yes, dad was going crazier, but then there was also this, the, they focused a lot more on the Jody presence, the, the mm -hmm. youngest uh, DeFeo sister that had been killed and, and her haunting the, the daughter and all of the kind of the theatrics with her getting out on the roof and all that kind of stuff that just seemed to be like large set pieces that they wanted to put in to jazz up the movie, you know, where the first movie um, spent time going over the kind of the lore and the mythos with the priest and the Carolyn's possession and all that kind of stuff. The second movie had chasing the daughter off the roof moments instead. Right. And that took a very long time and yeah. it was a big investment. We should mention that the priest in the first movie was played by Oscar winner Rod Steiger. He uh, won an Oscar for In the Heat of the Night opposite of Sidney Poitier. So he's <laughs> he's a pretty famous, well-known right. actor. But it got kind of accused of chewing the scenery in this one. Well, I think it's nonsense. <laughs> I like the element that he brought it. Like I said, for me, it brought in this, you know, reminder that we're dealing with evil. And in order to have good, you have to have evil to have this balance. And where is it going? Who's going to win? And who's going to be taken out along the way? 
All right. Well, I think we've discussed uh, several good and bad points here. So let's move on to the verdict. The verdict. All right, Sheila, as the first ever guest on the Battle Beyond the Movies podcast, which movie do you think portrays the haunted house theme most effectively? Well, thank you for having me on as the first honorary guest. I do appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm going to put this on my resume, but um, <laughs> I honestly think that even though Rotten Tomatoes gave it the, the stinker rating that it did, that the 1979 version did a better job in telling the story. We got a better picture of the history through this character, Carolyn, who turns out to be very pivotal. It did a better job in setting up, like we talked about the music when you and I watched this. There was this sing-songy theme that resonated throughout that was, I said, did this person take notes from Jaws, which was only three or four years prior, using the same variation on a theme. So when I heard that, la, 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 I was like, oh, some creepy is going to happen. <laughs> I was well, good. You, I, was, I was prepared for it. The, uh, the soundtrack was actually Oscar nominated that year. Did not win, but it was Oscar nominated. Hey, but it's something that stuck out to me. So, you know, kudos to them for for that. But no, I definitely enjoyed the story weaving, I think, better in the first movie. It just left me a little bit unnerved that I would say most of this kind of happened in some way, shape or form to this family because they ended up bolting out of the house 28 days later. I thought this 2005 story assumed that you knew the 1979 or the 1974 actual news version of what happened. I felt that they kind of took the liberties in knowing that this was 40 years of lore at this point. Um, So I thought the storytelling was better in 1979, but there was just more graphic and gore in the 2005 one because, you know, they had the special effects. So, you know, why the hell not? Exactly. I agree with all that stuff. The 2005 was flashy and it had the sexy leading man and um (laughs) (laughs) i mean that's not my bag but i i I, i've i've seen enough people magazines to know that that's a thing and it's got the gore that that was selling tickets right then and kind of still does you know the, the guys on hooks and all that kind of bullshit but i thought it put too much in front of us it didn't leave enough in our minds to get creeped out because it was like here this is creepy now look at this that's creepy and i don't know that that's the most effective way to have a haunted house story take place on on the big screen even though that first movie uh, i'm not going to give it like a like a solid gold pass for being a fantastic movie I know on our first ever in-person meeting in the flesh, Sheila, I don't know that I would ever recommend to another person that they sit down and watch an awkward cinematic sex scene as like the first thing to do with a new friend, you know, (laughs) Um, which is what we did. Just like not even kind of acknowledging each other as, as uh, a and and kidder kind of moan and writhe around generally awful. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was a risque sex scene for 1979. You know, they show yeah nothing. There's an award called the Saturn Award, which is meant to be sort of like a genre specific for science fiction and horror, you know, genres that may not get awards in other more well-known or prestigious, you know. Highfalutin, hoity-toity. Yeah, so you'll see things like Star Wars or something like that win awards, if win a Saturn Award, right? And so Margot Kidder, for instance, gets a Saturn, uh, at least a nomination for Best Actress for this movie. But then I don't know if this was the equivalent of a, of a Razzie, but there was something mm. oh. called the Stinkers Bad Movie Award. <laughs> <laughs> and Margot Kidder and James Brolin both won, in, or, uh, or at least were nominated for individual worst actor and worst actress. Uh, but they also had worst on screen couple uh, nominations for, for the portrayal in this movie. The movie had multiple stinker nominations that year. Yeah. By me saying that I prefer the storytelling, that doesn't mean that I'm running out to go buy this on DVD. 
there were odd things about it and the odd things that I guess in the storytelling and the continuity. And I did not get the chemistry between James Brolin and Margot Kidder at all. So the Stinker Award, I am wholeheartedly, did they win? <laughs> I, I don't, I didn't, I just put a nomination. So I'm not sure if they- Oh, okay. I'd like to know who won ahead of them because I got nothing between these two whatsoever. <laughs> no. Whereas like Ryan Reynolds and Melissa George, their two characters, I definitely got a bit more- of the believability that these two got married and he wanted to take on her, you know, three children as well. They're, they're a good match. Whereas yeah. Brolin was always a hard ass with her and the kids. Yeah. There was nothing warm about him. That moment when you're like, why did you hook up with this guy? Never really materialized. Yeah. Like you were Lois Lane 10 minutes ago. You could definitely land someone better. Exactly. Right. That said, I do prefer the 79 movie in terms of being a more effective haunted house story than the, than the 2005 movie. I just, I'm not going to, like you said, I'm not going to rush out and either rent it because that's a thing, I guess, or tell others <laughs> to go in <laughs> and see it. There's a red box somewhere, right? <laughs> if, if I had, to, if I was going to have a seventies horror movie night with my friends, I would probably include Amityville, but I would put it down the list or put it very early for people that don't show up early. You know, I wouldn't make it like the feature. The horror light people would be like, yep, I watched one of those horror movies. Exactly. I mean, there, like we said, there is some blood. There are some scares. It is effective in terms of making you believe that there might be something to this story. But there are <laughs> plenty of other reasons to write off the movie as cheese. Definitely. And then go look up the actual historical facts about the house and the case and things like that. And then you can draw your own conclusions. All right. So, Sheila, rating each movie in terms of uh, how well they portray the theme that, that they are battling over today, which is the haunted house theme. How many axes <laughs> would you give? How, George's axes specifically? Yeah, George's wood chopping highly polished because he just can't stop sh uh, sharpening it axes would you give each movie out of scale of let's say five i would give the 2005 to george axes and i would give this 1979 maybe four george axes you are kind. I would give the 2005 <laughs> a single axe and the 1979 two and uh, maybe a rusty backup axe. Um, mm. I'm comparing it to other things in my mind, uh, things that maybe have come later. Maybe that's just not even fair, but I, I do like it. I would probably tell somebody that, that wants to be complete in the haunted house genre or maybe 70s you know I iconic horror genre if they want to see everything then you definitely got to see that but i'm not going to hold it up as as <laughs> very yeah like comparing this to like you know like an exorcist right, or like a texas exactly. chainsaw massacre so the 2005 got one of the two axes because of the scene with ryan reynolds in the boathouse jumping in the water and just all of his muscles so one right. axe was just highly superficial <laughs> and that that's fine that is exactly the kind of uh i think that's the audience they were looking for exactly right 16 years later that someone's tuning in to be like hey damn he still looks good <laughs> <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Battle Beyond the Movies, and we'll come back for our next one as Mike from the Geekdom Fancast and I take a look at Heat and The Dark Knight as we compare movies featuring master detectives battling master criminals. If you liked this, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also interact with us on Twitter, Facebook, or our website www.podclubhouse.com Sheila, if people in the world want to subscribe to your newsletter, how would they find you? Mostly you can find me on Twitter. I'm at, at Shields McGangsta and you can find me through Pod Clubhouse. You just look through any of the Yellowstones or the Love It or Leave It. Um, um, you can find me there somehow to link me up. Or The Stand. The Stand. Yeah, I mean, if we want to go back in time for like, you know, some horror stuff. Yeah, we've got The Stand. You can go back for some supernatural stuff to The Alienist. 
See, you're, you're horror light. You're, you're, I'm horror light. I am solidly horror light, and I'm okay this way. Just, just you like to wade in. Yeah, just dip a toe in, but you know, I've seen Jaws, so I don't wade too far. <laughs> you, you're not as far as the last house on the left. That's you're not gonna do oh, no, that. I, mm, but I did sit through The Exorcist twice. Once I was seven, and once I was thirty-nine. So that seven might have set you up for. Well, that's why I have a very overactive. <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to dive into that on another podcast yeah well thanks a lot sheila thanks so much for having me this was a ton of fun so yep i'll see you at the uh the last axe on the left there <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening this has been an original pod clubhouse production pod clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.